Well, the topic now is when trumpets sound, and this is a very tricky subject. And there are so many views on the trumpets that uh, I don't think it would be right to be dogmatic about it and say this is exactly what it is. Let's look at the various issues and see how it fits in because we have lots to learn and I'm sure there are many, many things in the book of Revelation that uh, will only become clearer as the actual events unfold. Now many people like to put the trumpets into the future. There are whole schools of thought on this. But uh, you have a problem with the structure of the book of Revelation and uh, we will see that it's probably better to keep them in line with the chiasm, that structure which was set in Revelation so that we shouldn't lose our place. So what are these trumpets and what do they mean? Now before we get to the trumpets there are first some interesting issues which we pick up in Revelation chapter 7 all the way through to 9 and they actually form a unit. So I don't want to deal just with the trumpets, I want to deal with the package deal. So there's a numbering of the people of the earth in these, subject, in these subjects. So in Revelation chapter 7 and in Revelation chapter 9 there's a binding and a loosing and they are related to four angels. In both sections people are being numbered. In Revelation chapter 7 the people of God are being numbered. In Revelation chapter 9 the demonic counterpart is being numbered. So there's a numbering, those that are with God, those that are against God. In both the words are heard, I heard the number, cosa ton aritmon, I heard the number. So he heard the number of God's people, he heard the number of those that are with the other side. And of course, you know that statement, you are numbered and found wanting. That's what we find in the Old Testament. So it would be nice to be numbered and not to be found wanting. And uh, the way to do that is to cling to the Savior. So let's look at the numbering of God's people in contrast to the devil's people. You know what's interesting? God always gives the positive before he tells us about the negative. Before we saw how the Gospel Herod would be destroyed in uh, the seven seals, he gave us a picture of the throne room with such awesome power. So now here again he's going to give us the numbering of God's people. As I said, this chapter is parenthetical, it is put there in brackets to tell us something about God's people before he tells us again about the worst things that are going to happen. Who is able to stand is the question. The answer is only the sealed will be able to stand, so we would want to know what that means. The numbering of the people of God takes place just before the close of probation, prior to the opening of the seventh seal. So in other words, this is an issue that takes place just before the coming of Christ where there will be a final numbering of the people of God. Obviously God is going to wait until the full number is in because he told those symbolically sleeping under the altar that they will have to wait until the full number has been brought in. Isn't that right? So that's what the issue is about. And then we get to Revelation chapter 8 after chapter 7 and it says, and when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. So this chapter tells us about the sealing event for the people of God at the end. So let's go through it. Revelation chapter 7, 1. And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. Now, the sea, waters in the Bible are a symbol of the nations. The earth is the planet itself. The tree in the Bible is a symbol of the individual. Nebuchadnezzar was a tree that was cut down. I saw the wicked flourishing like green trees, etc. So that's a symbol of the individuals. 
And these four heavenly angels are holding back the winds of strife until God's people should have been sealed. So the final destruction, conflagration on the earth, chaos that will come, is being held in check by God, irrespective of how bad it looks, God is in control. That's what it says. So there are four angels holding the four winds until God's full number had come in. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, and he cried out with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Now, what sits here in the forehead? The seat of your intelligence, the seat of your decision-making capacity, your consciousness, this is what sits here in the forehead. This is what makes a difference between us and any other creature on this planet, any animal. This is the great cognitive decision, moral seat in the human being. And here is where you make a decision for or against something. And as we saw in the previous one, it, to be sealed is to be settled in the truth so that you cannot be moved. But God also seals these individuals. And I heard the number, there we hear the number, of them which were sealed. So these are the people of God. And they were sealed 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Revelation 7, 2 to 4. Now some people like to make this a literal number and say there are literally... 144,000 that are sealed. But remember, he heard the number. What does it mean to be sealed? Well, 2 Timothy 2 verse 9, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, that the Lord knoweth them that are his. So he has sealed them. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. So what does that tell you? These people have made a decision to stop doing what is wrong and to do what is right in the strength of the Lord. And to ask the Lord for forgiveness for that which they have done wrong and to ask for cleansing in the blood of the Lamb. Simple as that. It's not a complicated issue. We always make it more complicated than it is. And the word over here for iniquity is unrighteousness, injustice, unrighteousness of heart and life, a deed of violating law. Very interesting. So if you depart from iniquity, you become law-abiding. If you love the Lord, you keep his commandments. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more. But rather let him that him labor, working with his hands the things which is good, and that he may have to give to them that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to use for edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. It's not a very complicated issue. It means start doing what is right and give up what is bad. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. So people that are sealed have to start doing what is right. They have to, if they were thieves, stop stealing. If they have a foul mouth, they must clean up their act. They must start doing what is right in the strength of the Lord. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Ephesians 4, 26 to 32. It's not a complicated issue. Come back into harmony with the law of God. That's what it means. Bind up the testimony. Seal the law amongst my disciples, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. You cannot say, 
I'm a child of God, but I can live like I lived before. Uh -uh. To the law and to the testimony. I delight to do thy will, O my God, yea, thy law is within my heart. Psalms 40, verse 8. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in there. Mine. Where's that? It's here, in the forehead. And write them in their hearts so that they can act accordingly. And I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. Hebrews 8, verse 10. We always make these issues so complicated. It's not that complicated. Do what is right, and leave the consequences to God. Now, in the heart of the law, there is the Sabbath. Remember the Sabbath, to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor, and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. Not the third day, not the fourth day. The seventh day is the Sabbath. In it shalt thou shalt not do any work, nor thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor the stranger that was within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and he rested on the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So here in the Sabbath commandment is another seal. It says there, in six days, the Lord, that's the name, Yahweh, made, he's the creator, heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is. So, if we look at Exodus chapter 20, verse 11, in six days, the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that is, and he rested, Noach, on the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day, hallowed it, he put it aside for holy use, and the word rested there means to give comfort, to be confederate, to lay, to let down, to be quiet. In other words, to have a quiet moment with God. In all this excitement on this earth. Moreover, I also gave them my Sabbath to be a sign between me and them, that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctifies them. And hallow my Sabbaths, and they shall be a sign between me and you, that you may know that I am the Lord, your God. Well, there are many gods out there. Which one are you serving? The one that you obey. How do you obey him? By keeping his law. And if he said, honor the seventh day, then which day should you honor? The seventh day. Well, Exodus 31, verse 13, also says, the Sabbath is a sign throughout your generations that you may know which God you're serving. It's me. I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. Hello, me. Exodus 31, 16, wherefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generation for a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and them that he rested on the seventh day, and he was refreshed. Nafash, interesting word. Sign in the Hebrew is ot, and it means a mark. That's what the concordance says. It means a mark, a distinguishing mark. So what is the mark of God? The Sabbath. Why? Because the Sabbath ratifies the law. Without the Sabbath, the whole of the Ten Commandments could be from Joe Schmo. Isn't that right? Could be from Joe Schmo. What if I had made Ten Commandments and I sent them out and I said, everybody keep them because I say so? What would you do? You would think the man's gone nuts, wouldn't you? But what if the president of the country did it? If he made a law and he said, I want you to keep these, and I sign it, and if you don't, well, I have authority to do something about it, then it becomes a little bit more important, right? Now what if the God of the universe says, boom, I make this law, heaven and earth, it is to be experienced as a perpetual law. Well, that's pretty authoritative. So if it doesn't have that stamp of approval, it means nothing. So it is God's mark of authority. Does the beast also have a mark? <laughs> yes, it also has a mark of authority. We'll get to that a little bit later. So we must understand God's mark, his sign or his seal, just like a seal authenticates a document, the President of the United States, for example, that's the seal 
of the American president or the typical royal seal. It says, I, king so-and-so, the name, title, king, territory, whatever it is, England or whatever. And right here in the Decalogue, there must be a stamp authenticating the document. And you find it in the Sabbath commandment. Without the Sabbath, the whole of the Ten Commandments is just another set of laws made by who cares who. But with the Sabbath commandment in it, it has the name of the lawgiver and the territory, and it's binding. So it receives its authenticity. And the Lord delivered to me two tablets of stone written with the finger of God, Deuteronomy 9.10. There are only a few times when God wrote with his finger. Did you know that? And each time he wrote with a finger. This is one of them. He wrote the Ten Commandments with his own finger in stone. And he repeated it when Moses broke them. So that's twice. And then when the kingdom of Babylon came to an end, God wrote with his finger against the wall. And the prophet Daniel said, many, many, tekel parson. Wow, that's what it means. Your kingdom has been numbered and given to the Medes and the Persians. It's another time that God wrote when there was a judgment, a final judgment which serves as a type of what is coming. And there was another time when God wrote in the sand. That's when all the accusers came and accused a certain lady, Mary, who had been found in adultery. And he stooped and he wrote with his finger in the sand. I wonder what he wrote there, because when they read it, they all turned away and had nothing more to say. He that is without sin, let him cast the first stone. Maybe they saw written things there they didn't really like to read. Isn't that possible? Just for interesting sake. So God's seal is in the heart of his law. Remember the Sabbath that keepeth holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh is the Sabbath of the Lord, Yahweh, your God. In six days, Yahweh, Lord, made, creator, heaven and earth. There you have it, the Lord, creator, heaven and earth, authenticating the whole document. So it has his name, his title, his territory. I gave them my Sabbath to be a sign between me and them, that I am the Lord. Now how are you supposed to keep it? Well, we read about that. Not doing thine own pleasure. It's amazing how few rules there are on how to keep the Sabbath. The Jews couldn't handle that, so they made a couple of thousand on how you're supposed to keep it. Instead of leaving it to the conscience. Not doing thine own pleasure, that seems sensible. Calling it holy, honorable, Honoring him, not doing your own ways, finding your own pleasure, speaking your own words. Delight yourself in the Lord. So these are the positive things that come out of the Sabbath. Not a day of misery. By the way, today is the seventh day. It's the Sabbath. Did we have a day of misery so far? I haven't. And was it only for the Jews? No. Also the sons of the stranger that join themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, everyone that keepeth the Sabbath. Even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. It wasn't a Jewish Sabbath. In fact, it comes from Genesis. It comes from creation. For mine house shall be called the house of prayer for all people. The Sabbath was for everyone. Isaiah 56, verse 6 and 7. And it will be, if you will listen carefully to my commandments, which I command you today, take heed to yourselves that your heart may not be deceived. And then you go running after other gods, it says. Bind them, these commandments, as a sign upon your hand and as frontlets between your eyes. Wow! The commandments must be on the hand and on the forehead. What does that mean? Okay. So they wrote them out, stuck them over here, and bound them around their hands. Job done. Do you think that's what God had in mind? I somehow don't think so. That's ritualizing the law. And it might be sincere, but it's not what is meant here. It means think and act accordingly. That's what God wants. And God says his commandments must be 
in your mind and in your actions, and another power will come and says, ah, 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 my commandments in your mind or in your actions. Interesting distinction. Well, we're not going to go into that. Deuteronomy says the same thing on the hand or here, on the forehead. And it will be a memorial between thine eyes and on the hand that the Lord's law may be in your mouth. Exodus 13 verse 9. So God has something that must be sealed in the mind. The law of God and the Sabbath is the sign thereof in a very particular fashion. So the purpose of the Sabbath was to be a day of rest, a day of blessing, a day of peace, a sign, a memorial to creation, a symbol of sanctification, and a hallowed day and a perpetual covenant. Those were the reasons why God gave the Sabbath so that we shouldn't forget Him and what He has done for us. And so the law of God in its entirety with acknowledgement of His authority in our lives will bring us into harmony with heaven again through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. And that is what it means to be sealed, to come back into harmony with God. So how many are sealed? Revelation 7, 5, out of the tribe of Judah, 12,000. Reuben, 12,000. Gad, 12,000. Asher, 12,000. Nephthalim, 12,000. And so we go down through Manasseh and Simeon and Levi and Asachah and Zebulun and Joseph and Benjamin and they were all sealed, 12,000. So, do you think it's a literal number? Exactly 12,000 out of every tribe? What about us then? After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude. You see, he heard the number, but he looks and sees, he beholds a great multitude which no man could number of all the nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. Some people make long discourses about the 144,000 when the Bible doesn't tell us very much about them. And seeing that the whole book is symbolic, obviously this is also symbolic because we're going to run into trouble if it's not. For example, if we look at the 12 tribes of Israel, then we'll see that uh, Levi is mentioned here in Genesis, Joseph is mentioned over here, Levi is also mentioned in Revelation over here, and Joseph. In Ezekiel, we have the tribe of Dan, which is not mentioned over here at all, but it's mentioned in Genesis. We have Ephraim mentioned here in Ezekiel, and we don't have Ephraim mentioned here at all. So, which tribes are you going to take if you want to make it literal? You're going to be in trouble. Is nobody ever going to be saved out of Ephraim and Dan? Dan were pretty bad, and they did funny things, but there were lots that were Heroes from the tribe of Dan. Heroes. So obviously it's a symbolic number, and I don't think we have to go any further into it. It's a multitude of twelves. For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men but of God, Romans 2 verse 28 verse and 29, is it only Jews that are going to be saved from the literal tribes? What about all the Gentiles that have come in through the Gospel Herald? So we cannot literalize the 144,000. And in any case, who is a Jew? Who is a Christian? It's one who is one inwardly. Galatians 3 verse 29 says, If you be Christ's, then you be Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So what does that make us? That gives me a chance to be a seed of Abraham. Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise, if I accept Christ. Well, I wasn't a Jew, so I was a pagan. But in Christ... I can be Abraham's seed because Christ is Abraham's seed. And if I am in him, then I am redeemed. So now, the question of Jew or Christian is irrelevant. If you have Christ, you are Abraham's seed, no matter what your circumstances of birth were, 
For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them, and mercy and upon the Israel of God. Galatians 6, 15 and 16. So how do I become part of the Israel of God of all ages? I accept the Lamb of God. A Jew was not saved by keeping the law. He had to bring a lamb and slaughter it. And he was saved by the blood of the lamb. Maybe he rejected the lamb later on, but that was the method whereby he should be atoned for. And cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood around about the throne and about the angels and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces and they worshipped God saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. Who wins? Jesus wins. Again, we have this wonderful theme where Jesus comes in the Revelation and he tells us about the redeemed and how they are sealed, settled in the truth that they cannot be moved, back in harmony with the law of God, saved by the blood of the Lamb, and he gives us this beautiful picture before he gives us the bad news. It's a theme in the book of Revelation. You never have to be afraid because he is the victor, the king of kings. And one of the elders answered saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence come they? And he said unto me, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of the great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His temple, and he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell amongst them. That is the conclusion of the matter. A great story about victory in Jesus Christ before the bad news comes. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat, for the Lamb, which is in the midst of the throne, shall feed them, and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Isn't this great? Here's the promise before the bad news. And then comes Revelation 8. And when he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about space of half an hour. We've dealt with this text already. This is when Christ returns. And I saw the seven angels which stood before, the, before God, and to them were given the seven trumpets. Now come the seven trumpets. And people say, well, this must be after the close of probation. No, no, no. All we had was a chapter which says, Listen, folks, this is the outcome. God's people will be redeemed by the Lamb. And there will be no more tears, and this is the number of them, and this is what's going to be like. That's the victory in the Lamb. Now let me give you the bad news. This is what's going to happen in history. And those that reject the Word of God and reject Jesus Christ will also be numbered, and sadly, the number will look slightly different. Let's see what happened. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense. Where is this angel standing? At which altar? The altar of? Incense. The altar of incense, was it in the first chamber or in the second chamber? It was in the first chamber. So it cannot be after the close of probation. Jesus is still ministering in the first chamber. There still has to come a second chamber, and when that's finished, it's over. Then it's too late. So here we are in which part of the chiasm? The first part. Jesus is still in the holy place. 
And many people want to take these prophecies and throw them into the future, into the eschatological arm, into the end time events portrayed in the book of Revelation, and they violate the chiasm. You cannot violate the chiasm. You cannot tear something out of its position and throw it where you want it. You have to stay within the rules. That's why it's written like that, so that you shouldn't be able to do that. So, much incense, there's the altar of incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which is before the throne. That's the little altar that we're talking about. And the smoke of the incense, which came with the prayers of the saints, ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. Here are people praying. There is some need here still. This is not after the close of probation, right at the end of time. No, no, this is a continuous process. So it would suggest we follow the same process as the others were. This is a pattern in Bible prophecy. Book of Daniel does the same thing. Daniel chapter 2 goes through the history of mankind. Jan Daniel chapter 7 recapitulates it in another format. Daniel chapter 8 takes it, recapitulates it in another format. And so you have different views coming to light. Same in the book of Revelation. You go through the seven churches, this is the position of the church. You go through the seven seals, this is the position of the gospel herald. Now we come to the trumpets, which are judgments. Because there is a numbering, and you are found either wanting, or you are found righteous. Here is a judgment issue. And who is the judge? Jesus. He decides who makes it and who doesn't. And he doesn't neglect the prayers of the saints. It is through his mediation that they are made acceptable in the eyes of God. So the merit of Jesus Christ is the issue here at stake. The smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. So the incense is a symbol of the merit of Jesus Christ being added to the saints, making them acceptable in the eyes of God. Wonderful image. Everything is so loaded with meaning in the book of Revelation. We could speak for hours just on the symbolism here of this altar of incense. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and cast it onto the earth. <laughs> Down it comes. <laughs> and there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. Revelation 8, verse 5. Well, judgments come upon the earth. And after the final judgments, just as Jesus died on the cross and said it is finished, so it will be done, and it will be over, and the numbering will be done. And either you are with the, with the sheep, or you are with the goats, depending on your decision. So, what are these trumpets of Revelation? There are seven trumpets, and each one heralds something that happens here on earth. Revelation 8, verse 6, And the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. Now let's see what happens. Let me just recapitulate here for you. The historic arm had the seven churches, the seven seals, and because we are still dealing with altar of incense time, we are dealing before the time that Jesus enters into the most holy, so we're dealing with the historic arm, they sit in this side of the chiasm, and I cannot remove them and throw them into that side. That would violate the chiasm. Is that clear? So obviously, we are moving through the same historic period that we have had in the others. And to do anything else would be contrary to the system. And they all culminate of course, in the great climax of the coming of Christ. So again, we're going to sweep through history. And there is a parallel between what happens during the blowing of the trumpets and the seven last plagues. This becomes an interesting point. So the seven trumpets are blown before the Day of Atonement, and the seven last plagues take place after 
the Day of Atonement. In other words, when Christ comes out of the Most Holy, then the seventh last plagues will fall. So, if we look here at the trumpets, we'll find that the following are affected. The earth, eight, chapter 8, verse 7. The sea, chapter 8, verse 8 and 9. The rivers and the fountains, chapter 8, verse 10 and 11. Sun, moon and stars, chapter 8, verse 12. So there's darkness, bottomless pit, locusts come out, 9, 13 to 21. The river Euphrates, 9, 13, 21. Loud voices, the kingdom of Christ. So we've gone through a process. And every time, a third, a third, a third, a third, a third, a third is affected. If we look at the seven last plagues, we have a parallel. The first plague hits the earth. The second one hits the sea. The third one, the rivers and the fountains, just like the seven trumpets. And then the sun, just as it was over there, darkness on the throne of the beast. Then there's the river Euphrates, which you had over there. And then you have a loud voice, it is done. You see? There's the it is done. So this is what happens after the close of probation. And this must happen before the close of probation. Because it's only a third, a third, a third, it's not everything. A portion is affected. And there is room for repentance. And it is in the mediation time when Christ is serving in the heavenly sanctuary in the first chamber. And these are very important issues when we deal with this. Because today there is this tendency to take the trumpets and to make them the same period or just prior to this period over here. And that's a problem. Because not only do you violate the chiasm, you also violate the component. There's only a component that is destroyed. Jesus Christ is in control. The number of God's people, chapter 7, now, trumpets and the numbering of the people of the earth and the problems associated with it. Who is going to win? Jesus or the other one? We already know the answer. And therefore, we can relax as we go through the trumpets. May the Lord make us aware of the fact that Jesus is in control. When we're dealing with the actual trumpets, it gets tricky. Because we don't really have precise ways of interpreting this. But let's look at the various issues. This is a very interesting study. Joel chapter 2, verse 15, and 17, 15 to 17 says, Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, Assemble the elders, gather the children and those that suck the breast. Let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar and let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach, that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say amongst the people, Where is their God? Here is a situation where a trumpet is being blown under circumstances where God's people have obviously gone astray. So let's have a look at the interpretations. The first interpretation is that these trumpets are judgments in our time paralleling the judgments of the plagues. That's a very prominent interpretation in the world today. Personally, I cannot accept that particular interpretation, for the very reason that it violates the chiasm. It violates the chiasm and throws into the future that which is in the historic arm of the book of Revelation. Secondly, it violates the principle that Jesus is here, not coming out of the most holy, but is obviously officiating in the holy, long before these plagues are going to fall.
So there are two principles why I cannot accept that particular interpretation. Yes, there are contact points in that the plagues are descriptive of the same things that happen in the trumpets, but the trumpets are partial and the plagues are final and complete. So the judgments are obviously judgments in time. So judgments, the second way of looking at it, retrace the periods of Christian history covered in the seven churches and the seven seals. That makes sense, to me at least. And some start, well now, now the question arises, where do you start these judgments then? And who is being judged? Well, some start with the judgments against Jerusalem. Because Jerusalem are the first ones who rejected Jesus Christ and nailed him to a cross. And there was a judgment at the end. God still gave them a space of time till 70 AD. And then Jerusalem was destroyed, right? That's a judgment of God. And this is using Matthew 24 as a template. That seems to me a logical thing to do as well. Others, again, they like to start not with Jerusalem, but with judgments against Rome, because Rome is the power that actually nailed Jesus to the cross. So here you have two opposing views, but really it's not such a big deal as to whether the other one is perfectly right or the other, the fact of the matter is we are dealing with judgments over the time. Personally, I prefer starting with Jerusalem because that's also the template that is used by Matthew 24. But I'm not going to make a big deal if somebody doesn't want to believe that and believe the other. That's fine. Let's look at the first trumpet. The first angel sounded and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood and they were cast upon the earth. So here is judgment because parallels also the hail at the end of time, but in a partial sense, because a third part of the trees, the individuals, were burnt up and all the green grass was burnt up. So here is a destruction of people. People are being lost here. This is serious. Why are they being lost? Well, the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70 is the one possibility. And uh, I've color-coded them here. The second possibility is that this is a judgment on Rome, and the people that favor this view say it starts with the Visigoths that invaded Rome under Alaric in A.D. 396 to 428, and he pillaged Rome in A.D. 410, and the Roman Emperor Theodosius died in A.D. 395. So here we have a picture of the start of the fall of the Roman Empire when uh, these various nations came in. Well, this is a judgment that took place, absolutely, of this power that elevated itself even over the Prince of Peace. But on the other hand, the fall of Jerusalem is a very powerful judgment after a long time of probation that said, well, you have rejected the Messiah, these are the consequences. God removes his protection. He allows the wind to blow. And this is what happened. And the second angel sounded, as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea. And the third part of the sea became blood. And a third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died, and a third part of the ships were destroyed. So now again, what does this represent? What does this trumpet of judgment represent? Well again, we look at the various uh, interpretations. Mountains, what do they represent? A great mountain burning with fire? Well, a mountain represents a nation in the Bible. You can look that up in Isaiah chapter 2, 2 and 3, 11, 9, 13, 4, 14, 41, 15, Daniel 2, 35, 44, 45, Ezekiel, Zechariah. All of them have this picture of a mountain. Let's look at the text in Jeremiah, which also brings this picture to the fore. Behold, I am against thee, O destroying mountain, speaking about Babylon says the Lord, which destroyeth all the earth, and I will stretch out mine hand upon thee and roll thee down from the rocks and will make thee a burnt mountain. So here's the symbol of a mountain, 
that is being destroyed. So the second angel sounded, and as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea. So a nation, in other words, was scattered amongst the nations. That's what it would mean. And a third part of the sea became blood. Sea is a symbol of waters. The waters which you saw are peoples and multitudes and nations and kings. So bloodshed amongst this nation. And a third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died. And a third part of the ships were destroyed. Ship in the Bible is a symbol of the economy. The ships of Katrin. They are economic uh, symbols. So let's have a look at the two possible interpretations. If the first one was judgment on Jerusalem, then the second one would obviously be judgment on pagan Rome and the associated nations, the sea. Jews and Christians saw imperial Rome as the new Babylon. In fact, Peter even wrote a letter uh, where he said, where Babylon is. Because Rome, like Babylon, has destroyed the temple and Jerusalem. So that is a a reasonable assumption. On the other hand, some believe that the second phase of uh, the Vandal incursion into Rome under Genseric, 428 to 468, uh, where the word vandalism comes from, derived from the Vandals, and they pirated on ships on the Roman Empire and pillaged Rome in AD 455. So some see this as the symbol, and others see it as the encompassing the whole of pagan Rome. Now, whether you accept the one or the other, it's, it's a matter of detail, right? It's not something to make a great issue about. It's not going to uh, change your salvation in any way. Personally, I like the first one more because it follows a logical time sequence and frame, but it doesn't matter if uh, others prefer the other one. Third trumpet. And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven. Now, does that ring a bell? I'm sure it does. Did a star fall from heaven at any stage? Yes, Lucifer fell from heaven, and he brought all his demonic forces with him down here, and he was going to effect a great change. He was going to take over this kingdom. He wants to be the ruler. So false teachings is what he brought with him. Burnt as it were, burning as it were a lamp, and it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. These are also the peoples. And the name of the star is called Wormwood, bitterness. And the third part of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died of the waters because they were made Bitter. Now what does water represent besides nations? Have you heard of the water of life? Now what happens when the water of life becomes bitter? You see, there was a time period when there was compromise that came in, the third time period, do you remember that? Isn't this interesting? Here's the third angel sounding, the time of compromise. Didn't that turn the waters of salvation into bitterness, yes or no? Yes. And did people die because of it? In a spiritual sense now, not in a literal sense? Absolutely, because if you drink from this polluted fountain, what is the result? Death. Eternal death. Separation from God. So the great apostasy of the spiritual leadership of the Christian church is the one possibility that we have over here the falling away as Satan fell from heaven with a third of the angels, so the church would apostatize through idolatry. Wormwood was used by Moses as a symbol of idolatry. In Deuteronomy 29, 17 to 18, let's read it. And ye have seen their abominations and their idols, wood, stone, silver, gold, which were among them, lest there should be amongst you man or woman or family or tribe whose hearts turneth away this day from the Lord our God to go and serve the gods of these nations, lest there should be among you a root that beareth gall and wormwood. Isn't that a great symbol? So I kind of favor this because it's the same time period. 
You have the third angel. There was the period of the black horse. There was the period of compromise when the gospel was undermined and the waters went bitter. And people that drank this new gospel died a spiritual death. Well, the other interpretation would be that the invasion of the Roman Empire by the Huns under the leadership of Attila in the 5th century. So again, you have uh, interpretation that it still deals with the um, Roman Empire as such. Of course, this takes place in the Roman Empire, so there's no problem, but this is the one that just sort of gels it and brings it into line with all the others that we have seen paralleling them so far. And you have all the symbols that make this uh, seem to be that way. Now the fourth trumpet. And the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten. Now the sun, what is that? The light of the world. And a third part of the moon, and a third part of the stars, so as the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. This is not total darkness, as in the plagues. This is a third part. Revelation 8.12. Let's look at Micah, chapter 3, verse 6 and 7, and see if we can pick up a parallel. Therefore night shall be unto you, that you shall not have a vision, and it shall be dark unto you that you shall not divine, and the sun shall go down over the prophets, and the day shall be dark over them, then shall the seers be ashamed, and the diviners confounded, yea, they shall all cover their lips, for there is no answer of God. Doesn't this sound like a time of spiritual darkness, yes or no? Well, what did they call the age of the next? dispensation, if you like. Didn't they call it the Dark Ages? Yes or no? So who ruled in the Dark Ages once the dark horse had changed into a horse of death? It's the same time period. I believe we're just following the same classical period. And again, if you remove Jesus, the Son of Righteousness, from the Gospel, and make him less than he is, then you die a spiritual death. That's the, that's the problem. How did they remove Jesus from the heart of the gospel? This is the scariest story of deception in the history of the world. After this lecture, we're going to go into the details, and we're going to have a look at what they did. And I want to tell you that today, the whole world is deceived into believing something that is not from God. Scary. Scary. So the two interpretations that we have possible here, the darkness represents the dark ages. That makes sense to me. When truth was thrown to the ground, then the ministry of Jesus was replaced by the ministry of the church. When Jesus was crucified, a literal darkness covered the earth. Isn't that right? And serves as a type of the spiritual crucifixion, crucifixion of Christ. The reformation of the 16th century ended the Dark Ages. That's basically what this interpretation would mean. Now another interpretation would still be with judgments on Rome. The sun, the moon, and the stars have been interpreted as the luminaries of the Western Roman Empire, the emperor, the senators, the consul, with the extinction of the Western Roman Empire in AD 476, the last Roman Emperor, Romulus Augustulus, was dethroned by order of Odoacer of the Tilian remnant. So that's one interpretation. We have another judgment here on the uh, Western Roman Empire. But uh, this one over here, to me, represents a model that is in line with everything that we've seen gone before. But I'd like to no you to note something. And that is that in this time period of the Dark Ages, Jesus is crucified again. It's interesting that the crucifixion there keeps him on the cross. 
And that's where the Dark Ages would like him. But Jesus has been raised from the dead, and he rules in heaven. Now, it is also interesting that to remove Jesus from the system sometimes required even the creation of an entire new religion, which would take Jesus away. Very interesting. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people, but the Lord shall arise upon thee and his glory shall be seen upon thee. Isaiah 60 verse 2. Great darkness on this earth. Then spoke Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. The issue is Christ or not Christ? I am come a light into the world that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. John 12, verse 46. The issue is Jesus or no Jesus. Those are the issues. Now comes a fascinating part. Revelation 8, 13. And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe. Three woes to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpets of the three angels which are yet to sound. Now comes a great woe. Now a woe is something that hits mankind and has dire consequences. Now some people like to apply the woes to God's people. On the other hand, the woes could apply to those who are being lost. And who are we dealing with under the trumpets? Under the people of God that are being numbered or under the others that are being numbered? We're dealing with those others that are being numbered. So now, we know what the last woe is for sure. Because the last woe is the coming of Christ and the destruction of the wicked. So who does it hit, the last woe? The wicked. The wicked, not God's people, hits the wicked. So why not the other two as well? These are judgments on those that have either been deceived and allowed themselves to be deceived because they reject light, or who just reject God outward, directly. So three woes are going to hit the, the inhabitants of the earth, and a woe deprives them of salvation. So the inhabitants of the earth, by reason of the other voices of the trumpets, will suffer from these woes. So the three woes associated with the next three trumpets imply an unprecedented increase in demonic attack on the truth. Nevertheless, God is in control. So during these next three trumpets, God is going to give us a glimpse of what is happening here on this earth. It's scary. And it will require 12 whole lectures to make us see what is happening. Wow, we're going to do 12 lectures on what this entails. Scary. Woe, woe, woe was pronounced upon a church who walked in the sparks of their own kindling, who did not derive their light and power from the great central light, the Son of Righteousness and diffuse that light and glory to those who were in darkness. By absorbing and diffusing the light, they cause their own light to burn brighter. The one who receives light but does not give it as God requires him to do will become a receptacle of darkness. This is a writing that we find in a particular pamphlet written uh, about 150 years ago which seem to show exactly what is happening here. So the woes are pronounced upon a church which walks in the sparks of their own kindling. That makes sense to me. This makes great sense to me. So this woe is pronounced on the apostate people on this planet and will hit them because they are keeping the gospel truth away from those that could be saved. So let's look at the two possibilities. The fifth and sixth trumpets represent the numbering of Satan's followers and the final increase in evil to the point where God withdraws his protection and hands 
the willingly ignorant over to a retrograde mind. Wow, that's scary. This is in contrast to Revelation 7, where the sealed of God are numbered and empowered to stand under His divine protection. The other interpretation would mean that the fifth and sixth rep trumpet represent judgments against Eastern Roman Empire, the rise of Islamic culmination, Islam culminating in the Ottoman Empire is seen as the force to bring about its destruction. Now, here I would like to digress from my previous ways and say, why not marry the two? Why not marry them? Because Islam makes it its goal to bring Christ down to the level of a human. So in a sense, it does exactly what the Church of the Dark Ages did by pronouncing itself the judge in the place of Jesus Christ, right or wrong. So the one is just a tool of the other. They are actually working together to achieve the same ends to remove Jesus Christ as the only saviour of the planet. And it is interesting that Islam is a religion that actively propagates and teaches this message. Actively. The others on this earth do their thing and don't actively fight against this particular principle or that one. But the Church of the Dark Ages says, I am the way whereby you receive salvation. You come through me or you don't make it. In fact, they say God has to abide by the judgments of his priests and to either absolve or not absolve. Wow. And this power says, Jesus become less than you are. So let's, why not marry them? So which powers displaced Bible-based Christianity and which philosophies arose out of the Dark Ages to dethrone Christ and deprive mankind of salvation in him? Isn't that a good question to ask? That there would be woes upon the earth? Well, Islam replaced Christianity in the cradle of Judaism, Judaism and Christianity. Isn't that right? That's what they did. B, the age of rationalism and contemporary humanism with its slogan, no deity will save us, we must save ourselves. That comes from the Humanist Manifesto, chapter 2, edited by Kurtz Buffalo, 1973. This is their manifest. So, no deity will save us, we must save ourselves. Rationalism, contemporary humanism, the Bible is a book of allegories, don't worry about it. This has destroyed Christianity in the Western mind and this has destroyed it in the cradle of Christianity. The bastion of Christianity removed. It's replaced him in the West and this has replaced him in the East. So these are the powers which dethroned Jesus Christ. So now let's go to Revelation chapter 9. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven. Again, we have the star falling from heaven. Unto the earth and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. That's hell. So whatever doctrine's going to come now is coming straight from the pits of hell. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit. That's in total contrast to the smoke in the sanctuary above as the smoke of a great furnace and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. So, light is being removed from the earth as a result of the activity of the fifth angel. Wow! Not the activity of the fifth angel, but the curse which comes because of what the powers of darkness are doing. And they came out of the smoke locusts, upon the earth, and upon them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. The appearance of them is like the appearance of horses. We've had horses before. It concerns the gospel. Like the noise of chariots on top of mountains, nations. Shall they leap like the noise of the flame of fire that devours the stubble as a strong people set in battle array? And I will restore to you the years that the locust has eaten. That's what Joel said. So we have the symbolism of what was happening in literal Israel. Let's apply it to the spiritual one. Revelation 9, 4. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree. 
So not total destruction. But only those men who have not the seal of God in their forehead. So the judgments hit those that are being numbered. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented. And there's a period there, five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion. Jesus says, I will give you power to tread on scorpions when he striketh a man. And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it and shall desire to die and death shall flee from them. Then there's a description of the locusts. They are like unto horses. We've had horses before. They represented the gospel herald. Prepared unto battle and unto their heads there were crowns like gold and their faces, the faces of men. And they had hair as the hair of a woman and their teeth were as teeth of lions. Breastplates as were breastplates of iron, sounds of their wings, the sounds of chariots of many horses running into battle. Here's a war situation. So this is roughly what they look like, tails of scorpions, breastplates of iron, teeth, terrible things, whatever, an artist's impression. And they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. Revelation 9.10. Well, what does this mean? Well, some see in this symbolism what Islam did, and the other, you could see it in the full sense of what this new message without Christ would do to the world. Now let's have a look who's over them. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew tongue is Abaddon. Fascinating stuff, this. But in the Greek tongue has his name Apollyon. One woe is past, and behold, there come two woes more hereafter. Okay. Well, we know some names, interesting ones. And uh, after this, one woe upon mankind is finished. All right, let's ask ourselves a question. Which philosophies emerged after the Dark Ages which directly undermined faith in the Bible and Jesus Christ as the only name under heaven whereby we can be saved? Isn't that a good question to ask? Which organized bodies, is the next question I have, directly propagate the obliteration of Jesus Christ as the only name whereby we can be saved? Those are the two questions we would like to answer answer. Well, rationalism, higher criticism, humanism, spiritualism. Would you agree that those are the powers that remove Jesus? And then, which organized bodies directly propagate and obliterate the name of Jesus Christ as the only name whereby we can be saved? Freemasonry? I'll give you text upon text upon text to show that they do it. And the secret societies, they all are in favor of total unity and equality of all religious founders. Communism directly opposed the doctrines of Jesus Christ. Formalized atheism, that's all that communism was. And then you have the World Council of Churches, is that possible? Do they actually do that? Do they? I'm afraid so. Because the World Council of Churches propagates the unity of all religions under one roof, and that means that Jesus must become less than he is in order to reach this compromise, yes or no? So it's just a fact. I'm not making this up. This is what's happening. Islam removes Jesus Christ, does it or not, as the sole saviour of the work. And the United Nations has an organisation which is called the United Religions Organisations, whose aim it is to get all religions to accept their equality. Well, that's fine. It sounds like a good idea. But what does it do to Jesus Christ? It puts him on a level with all the others, and then there must be many a name whereby you can be saved. Yes or no? Is this correct or is it not correct? You tell me, because I'm in trouble here. I'm putting certain things up there which are problematic. But this is exactly what they are doing. Communism removes him totally. Freemasonry levels him. 
World Council of Churches compromises to reach it. Islam fights him directly and the UN says, you better do it or else. Wow, we're in trouble. Let me read this to you. This is nisbet.com Freemasonry. Let's read it. In the 17th degree of the Scottish Rite, the sacred word communicated to the candidate is Abaddon. In the Satanic Bible by Anton LaVey on page 145-146, Abaddon and Apollyon are one of the infernal names in Satanism. Scottish Rite Freemasonry Illustrated, J. Blanchard, Volume 1, page 453 states, Touch Tyler's forehead when he answers by putting his hand on your forehead. Password, jibbalum, sacred word, Abaddon. Didn't we just read that this was an evil angel? Yes or no? So Freemasonry says this is the angel over us. They had his angel over him, Abaddon. Satan. If you look at the Islamic interpretation, this is the range of the desert locust. And that is the range of early Islam, and today it covers that and more. Very interesting. This was the range of early Christianity. This was the range of early Christianity. Did you do know that? Today it's replaced. It's gone. It's been removed. It's been replaced by Islam. Islam arose only after 600 AD and totally removed Bible-believing, Sabbath-keeping Christianity in the world removed it, slaughtered it. Interesting. And today, it is forbidden, forbidden by law upon death to propagate Jesus Christ in those countries. Isn't that interesting? That is a terrible woe upon mankind. Because if the only name whereby you can be saved is removed, that's it, you're in trouble. John William Draper also writes the history of the intellectual development of Europe that four years after the death of Justinian in 571 AD was born at Mecca in Arabia the man who of all men has exercised the greatest influence upon the human race according to the life of Muhammad. Muhammad appeared on the scene at one of the darkest periods in history when all civilizations from Moravian Gaul to India were falling to ruin or were in a state of troubled gestation. Here we go, great war. At the age of 12, Muhammad traveled with his uncle in a trade caravan to Syria. Here he met the Christian anchorite called Bahira. Beholding the boy, so goes the story, he could discern in his face marks of the future greatness and he advised Abu Talib to take good care of him for he would someday be the recipient of a divine call the recognition of the prophet by Bahira, the Christian, symbolizes in Islamic tradition the primacy of Muhammad's mission over that of Christ. Jesus is made less. Revelation 9, 4, And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. So who is affected by these trumpets? God's people or the other people? The other people. Everybody who does not have the opportunity now to choose Christ because they removed it from him, they're in trouble. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but they should be tormented. Five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. Interesting, is the decree of Abu Bakr, Muhammad's uncle who succeeded him. When you fight the battles of the Lord, acquit yourselves like men without turning your backs, but let not your victory be stained with the blood of women or children. Destroy not the palm trees, nor burn any fields of corn. Cut down no fruit trees, nor do any mischief to the cattle, only such as you kill, eat. When you make any covenant or articles, stand to it and be as good as your word. As you go on, you will find some religious persons who live retired in monasteries and purpose themselves to serve God that way. Let them alone and neither kill them nor destroy their monasteries and you will find another sort of people that belong to the synagogue of Satan who have shaven crowns. Be sure to cleave their skulls and give no quarter till either they turn Mohammedans or pay tribute. Well, this decree is seen paralleled in the Bible and some believe that the five months 
represent 150 prophetic days, which would be 150 prophetic years, using Numbers 14 and Ezekiel 4 as template, a day for a year. And so it was worked out that if you take this number, and you take the date, July 27, 1299, when Ottoman invaded Nicomedia, then you add the 150, you come to July, 27 July 1449, when the last Greek emperor, Constantine, took the throne with permission from the Sultan. Now, Khaled bin al-Walad, by name Saif Allah, one of the two Muslim leaders of the normally successful, enormously successful Islamic expansion under Muhammad, and his immediate successor Abu Bakr and Omar. Although he fought against the Prophet, the second one, he was eventually converted, they say, and he conquered, and Khalid remained the effective leader of the forces that conquered the Byzantine army. They routed the Byzantine army, so Islam took over where Christianity reigned. Very interesting. And uh, they went on to conquer Syria and Arabia and destroyed 50,000 Byzantine troops and slaughtered them. So Christianity was removed. Let's look at the Masonic view. This is morals and dogma. This is the Masonic source. When Christianity had grown weak, profitless, and powerless, the Arab restorer and iconclast came like a cleansing hurricane. But Khaled, now you know who he was, he was this great general, the sword of God, he was called, who had marched from victory to victory, exclaimed to his wearied soldiers, let no man sleep, there will be rest enough in the bowels of paradise, sweet will be the repose, never more to be followed by labor. The faith of the Arab had become stronger than that of the Christian, and he conquered. Wow. This is Masonic view, that the faith of the Arab became stronger. It also says it became a better faith than Christianity. So today, Islam rules where Christianity reigned. And you have the ziggurats, and the Ottoman Empire, and the blue mosques, and St. Sophia, which all used to be Christian domains. Today, Islamic domains. This one is used to be Christian, today it is Islamic. Isn't that interesting? So, if we marry the two, then we have the whole full catastrophe of apostasy, bringing in the destruction of Jesus Christ as the sole saviour. Rationalism, higher criticism, destruction of the Bible, removal of faith in the Bible and in Jesus Christ, and literal war against those who opposed them. Then the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, Loose the four angels, whoa, now we're in trouble, which are bound at the great river Euphrates. So here are four other angels. We had four angels of God holding the four winds. Now we have four angels that hold the river Euphrates at the Euphrates. That's Babylon. So these are the demonic counterparts to the angelic counterparts. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year to slay a third part of men. And the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000 thousand. I heard the number. Can you hear? So you have the numbering of this power, and it is an enormous number, like the sands of the seas. So some see this time period as prophetic time, the hour, the day, the month, the year, and others say, no, this simply is a definitive statement of the time. Now, this very year, this very day, this very month, this very second, this is when it will happen. So whether you want the one or the other is probably not that relevant, and they probably could both be right. Some see this period as prophetic time, others as a designation of the time for the demonic forces of Babylon, in contrast to the angels of God that hold the four winds, to issue the last great events of the controversy between Christ and Satan. So the first woe was this destruction of Jesus uh, as the sole saviour, 
And then I saw the horses in vision, and then that sat on them, having breastplates of fire, yacinth. And he sees this whole vision of the smoke, and they're coming out and doing their thing. And a man by the name of Josiah Litch, he took the literary, literal interpretation, and he calculated when he took the hour, the day, the month, the year, and it comes to 391 years, 15 days, and he worked out the Ottoman Empire, and he predicted the exact day when the Ottoman Empire would fall, and it actually happened exactly like that. So here's the one view, the Islamic power there uh, officially comes to an end. Josiah Lich published this date two years prior to the event. So the four sultans are seen by some to represent literal sultans, and they even have names, Aleppo, Iconium, Damascus, and Baghdad. They see the uniforms of the Turkish horsemen in the description as being blue and yellow, and they see Islam in all of this and the Ottoman Empire. So whether you see it that way, or whether you see it the other way, in terms of a global spiritual darkening, does it really make a difference. Other interpretations that you could have is the spread of Arabian Islamic Empire, Muhammad 612, founding of Baghdad, Dar es Salaam, 762, marking the end of the empires, 150 years, fall of Constantinople, you get to 1844. There are many, many interpretations. Let's keep it simple. The trumpets herald apostasies on this earth which number those that are being lost. And the removal of Jesus Christ as the herald is of salvation is the biggest problem. The rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils, this is the point, idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk, neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their theft. So the description of the second woe in Revelation comes in Revelation 11. And the sounding of the seventh trumpet ushers in the final woe, the impenitent as the kingdom of God comes to an end. Now we can't jump and do Revelation 10 and 11 all in one night. It's going to drive you crazy. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the second woe in the next lecture. And you will see that the most terrible deception of all time comes in the next woe. And then comes destruction. We are living in the final moments before the third woe. Now what is that final deception that will come about? If the second woe already removed Jesus as the sole Savior, then what will happen before he comes with the clouds and every eye shall see him, and they which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him, even so. Amen. This is the question we have to answer. So we've seen Apollyon, we've seen Abaddon, we've seen some statements where organizations claim that this is the power ruling them. We've seen possibilities of Islam over here, we've seen rationalism and popular humanism and all these things coming in removing the doctrine of Jesus Christ and bringing darkness and woe upon the people. Now, when we get to Revelation chapter 11, we will see what the final deception is going to be, how Satan sets up his final kingdom to attack the Word of God. Scary stuff. And then we'll have to do 12 lectures to show that it's really like that. May the Lord bless us and keep us until we come together again tomorrow for a next episode in the series. Thank you for coming.